Praise God. It's good to be with you again this morning. It's good to um, be in the privileged position of just sharing what I believe God has laid on my heart for the church this morning. The undertone of the worship, just the, the heart that we're singing out this morning and just, um, I know that God's created an atmosphere for change this morning. I really believe that. And um, I'm going to try my best to get through it this morning, but there's such a sweet presence of the Lord this morning. There's a gentleness. And I was just so blessed these last few weeks, those of you that were here. Um, Pastor Carrot preached on um, Barefoot in His Presence. Enjoyed the series. Wasn't it challenging to us in terms of how God wants us to pray? And our God wants us to step out in faith as we pray. And God wants, to deal, wants us to deal with our sins and, our, and our, um, our problems. And that angels are there rejoicing with us and protecting us. Man, we've got a mighty God who loves us so much. And I, I had such a sense, as, um, especially last week, how I preached about the presence of God, that we needed to, to go a little bit deeper. So if it's okay with you this morning, I know it might be uncomfortable. But we're going to go a little deeper this morning. Please be respectful and reverent thereof. And I, um, I'm not here to, you know, to be on show or anything like that. I'm here to show you how much God loves you. And I really trust and believe that the word God's put on my heart this morning is going to be encouraging and it's going to allow you to be set free. So we're stepping out barefoot this morning. Is that okay? All right, so it might be a little bit uncomfortable, but all of you, plus your piece, you know, hey, when you, when you get out there, um, you, you scope by dinga off and you go for it, and there's freedom, and there's incredible liberty in, in walking in that freedom. And um, what I want us just to consider this morning is to take time to consider your next step in your relationship with God. If you um, haven't come to know Jesus as your personal Savior yet, God's going to walk a road with you if you open up your heart this morning and you see things a little bit differently. We'll get to that a little later. And put aside or kick off those proverbial Christian shoes of yours and step out barefoot. In other words, are you prepared to change the way you live your life as a Christian? And stepping out, because that stepping out speaks about being bold Come on, being humble and vulnerable enough to go deeper in our walk with him. Can we put up the scripture? We're going to focus on Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 this morning as, as our guiding scripture because this is really what our Christian lives, this is what life is really about. For by grace you have been saved <laughs> through faith. You've realized you can't do it alone. And you've taken a step of faith and you've said, God, I need you. And he, His grace comes in and his, his grace picks you up and His grace takes you on. His grace opens your eyes and shines upon you. It's not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works. You can't do anything to earn God's favor. You can't do anything to receive God's blessing in your own strength. So that no one may boast. And here we go. For we are his workmanship. We're his handiwork. We're his masterpiece, church. God created us. As the Bible says, um, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You're not just some akhoi together. Go and read um, Psalm, is it Psalm 138. I can't remember. I'm close. Okay. Hallelujah. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Good works won't lead us to Jesus. He created us because he put gifts and talents in each and every one of us. And his anointing rests upon you if you receive it to do and to then uh, what God prepared beforehand. And here's the key. That we should walk in them. Not sit and watch church. We should walk in in them, God has created you. God has called you to do good works. What are those good works? 
How's good works work to extend the kingdom of God here on earth? And if ever there's a time in the world today that we need God, it is today. Just look at the world. Look around you. I'm going to allude to that in a little while. But what is grace? Kweba said, um, Manky said a while ago, because you know me, I, I live out of acronyms. Uh, a few people from, from school here this morning, they know that, that that's what I do. I speak about acronyms and sometimes they don't get me. Praise God. Uh, it's okay. But what is grace? Grace is God's unearned and undeserved favor extended towards you and me. It's a gift from God. That cannot be earned through good works, but can be experienced as you step out in His presence and humble yourself so you can go where you've never been before. Do you want to go where you've never been before? In Him? So you can walk in freedom and in liberty and in victory? That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. You see, if you think about it, we've all got our favorite shoes, don't we? Come on. Uh, I know Pastor Kubis's favorite shoe. Okay? And I have my But it, it's, it's that, that felt school. When you go on a trip, Ru, you put on those special, I'm getting out of your shoes, man. And you're comfortable and you're ready to pack that camper and all die mooi goed wat jy gemaakt het. And off you go. We've got our shoes, right? We all have that favorite pair of shoes. Sometimes when you're walking, um, and people are around you and you look ahead and you see, oh, no, there goes Jessica. I recognize those pink pluckies anyway. <laughs> you, you recognize people from the shoes that they wear in that way. Um, so this morning, we are going to do things a little bit differently. So I don't know about your shoes, okay, but these are what mine look like. Okay, they, they, they're called slippers because you're supposed to slip in them. Okay. Normally there's a three-point check. Pastor, I don't know if you know this, but we, before you preach, it's buttons, zip, and laces. Because you don't want to fall or embarrass yourself. In it. So I can't do that this morning because I've got no laces. But, but hear me out this morning. Okay. My shoes, my spiritual shoes, and I say this very humbly to you this morning, sometimes get a little bit like this. My Christian walk... Sometimes it becomes too comfortable because they lack it to put on after work. Hey, come on, guys. Get home. You just wear on those slippers. Okay? And you just put up your feet and you relax. So this morning, what I want to do as, as, as I go through, we, we need to kick these things off. Okay? Let me bring them back a bit because I don't want it to put you off. <laughs> but you get, you get where I'm going. You see the story about life is actually very easy to explain. Bottom line is God loves us so much that he pursued us when we didn't deserve it. Come on, how about that? He saved us by his grace when we were lost, desperate and hopeless. Come on, you wouldn't have been saved if you weren't in those three situations. He knows you. He knows where you are at. He knows your battles. He knows your disappointments. He knows your hurts. He knows your shame. Things you've been walking with all these years, never dealt with. He knows your shame. He also knows your dreams. He knows your heart's desires. See, that's what that GRACE stands about. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what grace is, people. You see, we cannot go deeper or even begin to walk in Him if we don't embrace Settle and walk in this one thing. It's not about you. It's all about him and what he can do in your life and the way he can change you, transform you into the person he created you to be. I look at that and I think, well, then... then if life's so simple, you know, why is things so complicated sometimes in our lives? Because we, we get in those situations, right, where things are just, you know, that's not to feel. Um, I don't understand this thing. This thing happens to me over and over and over again. Come on now, you know. And you get to that place where you start living your life out of something I call a for, F-O-R. You all know the word for. 
Okay, it's for the sake of doing this. I do it for a good reason. You know, I have a shower because you know I have a reason to go and have a shower. It's for my well-being and my my health. Okay, so there's a four in everything that we do. Four stands for frame of reference. Frame. What is your frame of reference this morning? Because if you think about it, your only frame of reference should be because of Jesus. That's your only, if everything that happens around you is to realize it's all because of you, Lord. I can't explain what's happening now, but I know you've got a plan and a purpose in this. Come on. What's it about? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That should be your four. Your frame of reference should be God can work in this situation. God can change my heart. God can re-engineer and um, set purpose in my life if I've lost it. Because God is the only one who can. Why? Because he's able to strengthen you. And he pours out his grace upon your life every single day. Just look around. And realize it is by grace that you've gotten through this day. It is by grace that you've been able to push through that difficult day at work, whatever it might be. We're at that time of the year, church, that we do the proverbial thing, the end of the year. Okay? And it's got something to do with next year. Uh, What is that? What do we do at this time of the year? We make New Year resolutions. Okay, New Year, they don't work. They don't work. No starch until March. (laughs) No fear for a year. Yes, the the second second week of January. Ah! They don't work. Hallelujah. The only resolution that works is resolving in your heart to seek after and to be in his presence every day. Because once you do that, everything else comes to me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all, not a, 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 not a few, all these things shall be added unto you. We need to be in his presence every day. We need to seek after his presence in our lives. Gerard shared briefly last Sunday on Moses' burning bush experience and David's grease lightning dance. We're going to look at that in context this morning. First slide, please. I I think it's that one. Yes, it is. So we are walking on holy ground as Christians. We are walking every time you step something. The Bible does say every place on which your foot shall tread, I've given it unto you. So if he's given it unto you, it must be holy. So when you walk in his presence, you're walking on holy ground. You see, God spoke through the burning bush to Moses. At the moment of his calling to free God's people from bondage. Irrespective of his position at that time. He had, he was bang. Okay, things went horribly awry in Egypt. And now he... There in the Midian plains, he'd found a family, okay? But irrespective of his position or his fall, because he had a fall, he had a frame of reference, right? I stutter, I can't. I'm useless. Look what I did back there. Okay? No, I'm doomed to to failure. He had a low self-image. But you know what? God needed him to do something for the kingdom. And so God spoke to him and said, remove the sandals from your feet, for you are standing on holy ground. When Moses' bare feet hit the ground, his life was never the same again. Wow, think about that for a moment, church. When his feet hit holy ground, when he saw that fire in that bush, that was something he couldn't understand for a moment, but it got his attention. Man, um, but my question to you this morning is, what about the holy ground of our souls? What shoes do you need to remove this morning as you stand before God in His presence? Did you just worship because it was lacquer? 
Did you just worship because the music was really sweet? Words were great. When you worship, you're standing on holy ground. Be reverent and, and be grateful to God for what he's done in your life. And belt it out, sing it out. Shut your frame of reference off and say, God, come and show me. We also need to remove those different shoes. So what are they? I hoid mine off. Shoes of comfort. Complacency and conformity. Those three C's. Comfort, complacency, and conformity. Quibus once asked, I think a couple of months ago, Quibus, I think it was, how long have Rochelle and I been in the ministry? And to follow Kampa from my sit black off. Because I realized collectively we've been in ministry, we've been Christians for 80 years. So what do you think? That said to me immediately, Soyas, you're done. Eight years, long time. <laughs> That's for the bay. But you know what? I'm laughing a bit. But Rochelle and I have been talking a lot lately about the next 20 years. Or however long would grace us and give us. Because God is not finished with me yet. God is not finished with you yet either, irrespective of your frame of reference and where you are at in life at the moment. He wants to do new things in you and through you. It's going to take something. We're getting there. So yes, Moses, up on the high ground. By the way, when you're up on high ground, there's protection. When you're in his presence, there is protection. You see, God had been working on Moses for a long time, 80 years. (laughs) <laughs> but Moses seems to some degree to be unaware of God's preparing him from the work that he was calling him to do. But after this barefooted moment, Moses becomes the greatest leader the Old Testament has ever seen. Up until the time that Jesus came, no one else arose in Israel. Nobody that could match Moses. God used Moses to bring Israel to himself. Moses led the children of Israel out of Egyptian slavery. 40 years of wilderness wandering, Moses received from God all the laws that would govern the people. Through God, Moses made his covenant with Israel. And Moses' ministry all began as he stood barefoot in his presence. Wow. Moses was a shepherd. He was tending his father-in-law's sheep. He was doing the same thing that he did every day. Some of you feel a bit like that. You know, if you think about it, guys, um, we, we sometimes go through life, okay? And there's this little saying that says, um, if I can remember it, um, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. The same old, the same old. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. The same old. Until you stand in his presence on holy ground and a paradigm shift hits you completely. Your frame of reference gets knocked left, right, center, boo and honor. You see, the fire in the bush didn't consume the bush. You know those fake fireplaces? No, I see a good name, but brand my just a lucky and it likes to suffer. Just keeps on burning. We need to have one of those burning bush experiences, people, that we keep on burning. Bush was never consumed because God's presence was in that bush. But can you imagine, put yourself in Moses' shoes just for a moment, okay? I mean, if if I was him, I would have run away. I take off. What's going on here? This mountain's going to burn down. But after I looked at it very quickly, I said, wow, wow, there's something different here. Okay, and, and he thought, let me not get too close, <laughs> because this doesn't look very safe. You see, God speaks and says, Moses, I've observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry. I know their sufferings, and I've come to deliver them. And by the way, it's you. Can you imagine for a moment? He says, so come, I'll send you to Pharaoh. To bring my people out of Egypt. Your first thought will be, I'm not going back. <laughs> There's no ways I'm going back. Um, 
so what do you think Moses does in this moment? He whips out his iPhone. He said, uh, sorry, God, I'll just check my calendar. Uh, no, 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 no. On that day, um, I have a, a 10 a.m. Um, meeting with my father-in-law. Um, we, we've got some planning to do. And then at 2 o'clock, I'm doing a, a sheep shearing lesson with Aaron. He's going to teach me how to share. Oh, and then later on in that evening when I get home, oh, I've got a history lesson with my kids. I've got to, I've got to teach them about knowing the ark. Oh, it's on their curriculum. <laughs> no, he doesn't do that, does he? <laughs> it's funny, but... No. You see, the presence of God gets his attention and his obedience. Wow. God needs to get your attention this morning. He's going to ask you for your obedience. We need to walk in the awareness of God's holy presence every day. Not just when we're in church or in small group. Every day. See, when Moses took off his sandals, he was taking off something he had made. And he stood on something God had made. So I can't get that out. Moses took off the things he had made of his Christian walk. The things you've comfortably put your shoe on and said, this is how I walk as a Christian. Yeah, I listen to the word of God. I read it. But I'm comfortable doing this. It's okay. God wants you to take that off today. And stand on something he has made. And given you. And that's his presence. See, because only there can you separate yourself from the things of this world. And get God to shield you from the sharp points of pain and suffering that besets you. It's almost like a lot of you are walking around with I great safety boots. How many of you are in construction? Well, no. You know those big safety boots? Pastor Quibbeth, I great good. When you walk around in those things, you can walk on anything, even on a chainsaw. It won't cut your feet because they cats, you know. They're strong. Okay. You see, but when your shoes are off, you have to watch where you walk. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> God wants us to walk carefully in his presence. God wants us to watch our steps. See, barefooted saints walk more carefully than those with shoes on. Come on, church. See, everything changes for Moses at this point in time because of his encounter with God. It's a revelation of God to himself. And the God that he encounters is a God of fire. Wow. See, this kind of fire requires no fuel. God was in the fire. Moses just stepped into God's habitat. That's where God lives. That's his presence. Don't need anything. I need funny things to happen. Walk into his presence. Let him burn you. Let him burn you. Let his fire burn. Let his presence come down upon you. In your quiet times in the morning, as you're driving in your car, whatever. I don't know about you, but there were times that I worshipped the Lord so loud in the mornings in the car by myself. Because no one, the people hear me in the shower, but in the car they can't hear me and I can't sing. And I praise and worship the Lord, but then I know you must watch the road. Okay? Be careful. But. Yeah, get to that place where you just let his presence overtake you. Hallelujah. So, where are we? God tells Moses, remove the sandals from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. It's time for us to stand in his presence. So that his presence can transform us. My question to you this morning is, what shoes do you need to take off? Do you need to change your form? What's your frame of reference? Allow the fire of God to burn in you this morning and change you. Next point. Being vulnerable draws attention. Hello? David danced before the Lord. Remember that? I'm not going to read the whole scripture, but Pastor Quibbis alluded to it last week. The Ark of the Presence, um, uh, Ark of the Covenant, God's Presence comes back after being well looked after in the home of Obed-Edom. And it comes into public display now. And the king of Israel, David, is the first one to run out there and to rejoice. Because he realizes the power of the presence of God. And that the people of Israel need his presence. He didn't just go out there and say, people, um, the presence of God, the presence of God. What did I do? 
There's a song that says he became even more undignified than this. If you read there, his wife was standing on the balcony and said, No, 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 you can't do that. Look at the maidens, they're looking, and oh, there's something wrong in her mind and in other people's minds. David had lost it. No, David had found it. David found the joy of being in God's presence. David found the liberty of letting go and letting God. Come on, church. That's what it's about this morning. Are you bold enough to go against the norm? Look at Isaiah chapter 20, um, verse 2 to 3. Uh, I don't know if you remember this passage of Scripture, but the prophet Isaiah, remember he was called by God um, to bring word to the people. Um, and he, he said to him, take off the sackcloth from your body and the sandals from your feet. And he did so, going around stripped and barefoot. Then the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot before me for three years as a sign and portent against Egypt and Cush being Ethiopia. So the king of Assyria will lead away stripped and barefoot the Egyptian captives and Cushite exiles, young and old, with buttocks bared to Egypt's shame. So what, what's the backdrop of this? Isaiah hears from God. God tells him to do this. Not for one day, for three years. Oh my goodness. I, I can't get my head around that. Okay, But in chapter 6, Isaiah said something. It's called a declaration. Go read chapter 6. He says to God, as a prophet called by God, one simple sentence. Here I am. Send me. Here I am. Send me. So he had no choice but to obey God in that moment. What we must remember that it was a sign in Israel um, that the Assyrians invade Egypt and Ethiopia. That there was going to be a lot of shame. There was going to be a lot of heartache. And he went around actually showing, because in those times the prisoners were, were stripped and it was a horrible ordeal. And he was standing in the gap. He was acting out on a prophetic um, a message from God. Um, so that he could trust in God and rely upon him and not on the circumstances. So sometimes God might ask you to do something completely against the norm. You see, God has called us to be vulnerable. God's called What's the greatest mission that God has given us? Is to know his word and to make it known. To share his word with others. To passionately tell people about Jesus. So that they wouldn't be lost. That they would be saved. And our whole lives as Christians, even before we went to, to Kenya as mission, Rochelle and I ran soul groups. We, we wanted to serve God. We had a desire to serve God. And we did that quite comfortably until one day God did something. And, and allow me to ask Rochelle just to come and share something with you this morning. Because you all know my dear wife. Okay? And what she's going to tell you, uh, hold on to your seats, okay? Because it could happen to you too. But oh my word, how it changed her life. I'm just going to share the story with you. Good morning. Um, this particular day, I, I just to give you a bit of background, I worked at a doctor's practice right around the corner from us and got to know the neighborhood um, in that, in that way. And God had led Peter and I to start really praying for our neighborhood. So we used to walk the neighborhood, pray on walls for houses to be saved. And um, we'd just take evening walks and do those kind of things. And God particularly burdened me for this one lady that used to come into the doctor's practice. I just knew her first name and her last name. And her name was Mandy. And I just became really burdened for this lady. And I knew she lived just down the road from us because obviously we have their addresses. And I became increased, increasingly burdened to pray for her to the point where I woke up in the middle of the night. Now, if anybody knows me, <laughs> I'm not a nighttime person. I do not wake up at night to pray. It's something even God knows about me, but <laughs> this time, I found myself praying and interceding at two in the morning. That's usually my husband's job. And I got to the point where 
God showed me stuff. His Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, you need to go to that house and you need to speak to the man of the house and tell him that the penalty for adultery is death. When I shared this with Peter, he said, this better be God. I said, I've never been to that house. I've never met the man. I only know the lady from the doctor's room, but I really feel that we have to go to that house. So Peter said, we, I said, well, I'm not going alone. And we prayed a bit more. And we started off down the road. It was a beautiful summer evening, but my hands were shaking so much that I had to put them in my pockets. My teeth were chattering from fear, but not fear of, it's just the natural fear that man feels. But I had the boldness of God carrying me and Peter by my side, believing wholeheartedly that I'd heard from God. And it was the longest hundred meters of my life. And I got to the door and the guy opened the door and there he stood. And I wanted to say, maybe, maybe the penalty for abuse is death. <laughs> I should rather tell him that. And he's standing there with a cigarette and he goes, yeah. So I said, um, is Mandy home? I'll call her. <laughs> and he says, Mandy, your friends are here. And she knew nothing about us. I mean, she's never met him. She's seen me at the doctor's room. And we walk in and I said, actually, I'm here for you. And he comes and he sits down. And I said, I have a message from God for you. And I said, I know this might sound very strange. And I don't normally go around to people's houses telling them I've got a message from God for you. But I feel like I have to be obedient because God loves you so much that he's moved my heart to pray for this house. And I said, I've come with a message that the penalty for adultery is death. But God has paid the price. And he just looked at me and he just said, no one in their right mind would walk down the road and come to a stranger's house and tell, some, tell them this. He goes, I believe God sent you. And anyway, we said we have a soul group just down the road. To cut the long story short, that very next soul group he came and all the men took him and he led, his, led him to the Lord. He prayed the prayer and he said that day was the day that he was leaving his wife. He had packed, he had left two little kids, he had packed ready to go and their whole life turned around from that day. You see, when you're in his presence, God sometimes requires his people to do some things we would consider very embarrassing and weird and a no-no. But I know my wife and I knew God had spoken to her. But when you see David, David's a king, right? He's a dignitary. And he's losing it there in the streets and he's dancing before the Lord. You're a dignitary for God. Why? Because the Bible says you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation set aside for his purpose. See, your dignity may have to be put aside to accomplish your calling. Your dignity might have to be put aside. Your pride might have to be put aside so that you can accomplish your calling in him. Are you willing to be undignified to be his dignitary? Yeah, he's called to you this morning. Take off your shoes that symbolize your spiritual dignity. That pain you're holding on to because you were hurt as a teenager or um, as, as, a, as a student in school, in your home, whatever you might have gone through, he's called to you this morning, take those shoes off. Stop hiding your shame. Stop being in this place of just wanting to be secure and safe, but actually you're not. All your casualness, just your comfort in serving God. It's time to be humble and obedient so that you can get people's attention. More than that, you can get God's. So when David danced before the Lord, I thought of myself. 
when I dance in a room, it clears. <laughs> Not because of what I'm wearing, it's because of how I dance. I can't even dance, Neil. I've got four left feet, forget about it. Too. See, David danced before the Ark of the Covenant in front of the whole of Israel. <clears throat> Look, I don't know the context of, of what he did. But one thing I do know is we use clothes to mask or express who we are. We dress up in such a way, not just physically, but in our attitudes and in our mannerisms. We dress to hide, to blend in, or to stand out. Is appearance really everything? Well, for the youth of today it is. Just look how they're living their lives. Appearance seems to be the culture that tells us that image is everything. In the midst of a dress for success world, how do we find out what is real? I think we can be very confused when we look around there. See, in his victory romp celebration as the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence came in. He, he went from being a king to being a worshiper who worshiped God in spirit and in truth. It appears, at least in David's case, that there was extreme joy and a complete sense of abandonment in God's presence. You see, when you get to that place, you don't really care what other people say. You don't really care whether you're conforming or not. It's just not about that. See, he didn't care about appearance. He only cared about presence. Think about that for a moment. He was a king. He had a lot to lose, but he did not care. The presence overrode the position. I pray this morning that God's presence in your life will override the, override the position you've put yourself in as a Christian. In whatever shoes you're wearing. Come on, church. Just, just hear my heart this morning. God wants to change us. God wants to use us. God wants to set us free to be his vessels. But we're stuck in our Christian cultures as much as we are stuck in our own family cultures. And what's that? It's driven by tradition and norms. What we wear and how we must wear it. I now realize I wear robes from my youth that I, I need to throw off. So that I can dance the dance of my life for once. Well, I have before, but kind of lost it. Because of those slippers. I would probably be considered undignified by the Michaels in the windows and... And held in honor by the slaves of the servants. But if that's the case, then that's fine. Just get the stuff off me. Yeah. I want to dance. I want to step out barefoot in his presence. Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. A favorite passage of scripture. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life that we are leading in faith. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up and entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. And we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion, the author, and the finisher, the initiator of our faith and the perfecter of our faith. Because of the joy set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding it's shame. And now he's seated in the place of honor besides God's son. The greatest act of humility is when Jesus went to the cross for you and for me and he died on that cross. He took the sin and the weight of the world upon his shoulders because he loved you enough to become vulnerable, to strip himself. He humbled himself to the point of death and death on the cross. I'll ask the worship team to come up. If Jesus bared all so I could live, then I need to be to bear all so that I can live for him. <laughs>